Okay, awesome. So uh, my name is Tim Bodie, and I'm talking about CHAP, uh, which as fellow just read, it's a program to clarify dynamic memory usage in uninstrumented cores. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. As a background, I actually created this a while back as something called AH64, and it was just used internally within um, my company, which is VMware. And the motivation was I, I was seeing bugs go by that were not assigned to me where there was this huge test setup that ran for weeks. And occasionally you'd get that the process would crash because it ran out of memory. And the developer who got signed the bug would look at it and they would say, oh, can you run that again? And the process had been running for like three weeks or something like that. So it occurred to me that there was a core there and I started first looking at it by hand. And you can do a fair bit by hand because if you're familiar with, in our case, we use glibc malloc. And glibc malloc, there are all these numbers that get you to the next one. And if you know roughly when you're in the area, it's pretty easy to find stuff around. But to find all the things and in a dump that's many gigabytes, it's not convenient, right? So I first set about just automating finding the allocations. And then I could say, well, there's a lot of things of this type. And that really wasn't quite enough because in many of these cases, it was container growth. And what was really needed was the edges going back to um, the container that was getting big or container or containers. So I added that and then uh, it was very, it paid for itself almost immediately in terms of figuring out those kind of bugs and stopped that one problem of having to reproduce those problems because we could immediately start looking at these cores. The key thing is since it works on cores that you haven't done anything to them in advance, you can just look at them with this and figure out such problems. Um, I, it didn't quite, wasn't quite ready for leak detection at that point because for leak detection you have to have a much more precise notion of what's allocated, what's freed, very precise and because it's all about reachability and, and edges and you have to have a clear notion of where the stacks start and end and what your static memory is and so on. Hi, right, welcome. You can sit farther back if you like. No, you're good there? Okay. Um, but since then we've used it very heavily in our the the not open source one in our development and, and test cycle. Um, every time a developer checks in for a wide range of products, something tells them after running these standard tests that were already being run, takes a live core and checks whether they introduced a leak. And it's nice because you know they haven't added so many lines of code. And uh, uh, and developers also use it for another use case, which I'll show just very briefly, is as a sidekick to a debugger because you can ask like what is that location of memory? Like is it, maybe it can tell you the, the type, if there's a vtable thing in the allocation, it can tell you the start of the allocation, whether it's leaked or freed and so on. And so people use it as sort of a sidekick to GDB also. Um, it just recently, very recently became, like a month ago, became available as CHAP. Um, CHAP is not identical to H64 for a number of reasons, some of them legal. Um, uh, some not, um, and it's available there if you want it. Uh, it stands for Core Heap Analysis Program. All it does is it takes a process image as input. I'm using that in a very general term because, you know, at some point it could be a, an mdump file or something like that. In, for, for this open source version specifically, what it is willing to read is uh, an ELF core file. And it has to be from 32-bit or 64, and it has to be in the same byte order as you want. And again, it's supposed to um, provide information about dynamically allocated memory. The caveat there is that the only allocator this supports right now is glibc malloc, as opposed to je malloc or tc malloc or any of these local allocators that you know John was talking about. Yes, excuse me. Can you describe cores? Like, you Core? It's a CPU, it's a, it's a, it's, yeah, it's so, so there's a format called ELF. It's, it's, it's the, it's the image of the process when it dies, say, on Linux or, I guess it would be true for Unix too. A core file. Yes. Uh, so, I'm sorry, the question was, what did I mean by core? And I meant a, a core file as a process image on Linux or wherever. Um, and, okay. So, uh, 
some use cases that it supports, and it's a broad one. You know, people often look at this and think, oh, well, it's about finding leaks. It does do that. It, you can, it's precise enough about it. It doesn't show, um, except there are cases that I'll talk about later, but for most processes, you can use it reliably enough that if it tells you there's a leak, there really is one. So we have it all different places where people run and say, okay, the thing is leaked. As opposed to some, some many things that find leaks find you some false ones too, and you have to wade through them. Um, after that, you can use it interactively to do a leak analysis. It's not going to analyze the leak for you. Um, uh, you can use it uh, to uh, figure out growth, as, as that was the original use case. Um, the tool itself can detect some kinds of memory corruption, and the reason for that is because there are all these data structures that are used by the allocator, and it walks them, and there's all these ways that they can become inconsistent, and it can find those. And the last uh, that I mentioned briefly, too, you can supplement a debugger like GDB because it'll allow you to say, tell me what's going on with this address. Um, you know, is it allocated? Is it not? Is it... Um, if, if to the extent that the type can be deduced from a V table or something, it can tell you that. So this is a very simple list use case. And all it does is, in this case, since chap takes standard input, I, you know, passed count leak, that command count leak to, uh, to chap, specified the core, which was there. And it said, oh, okay, yeah, there were some leaks on, on this core, which was from Nautilus. And this is how much space they used. So uh, people often, shove that into scripts that are doing, you know, more interesting things. Um, and they typically grab a core at the end. So <clears throat> why a whole other one? There are, there are a lot of memory tools out there. And the reason is all about the not having to um, pre-instrument. Because um, pre-instrumenting has, generally has a bunch of things. You have to make the process a little bigger because you have to store stuff. You have to make it a little slower because you have to take the time to store it. You, that messes up the timing, the fact that you're taking that time to store it. And the last is some of them alter the location algorithms, and that actually matters quite a lot because when you're figuring out things like size of a process and stuff like that, you don't just care about the, the used allocations, what you actually asked for and didn't give back. You also care about the free stuff because as I'll show later in this talk, sometimes the free stuff can actually dominate um, totally, and that's a lot of what, between the, the major allocators that are people picking between like J.E. Malik or the one from GLibc or so on, that's a lot of what differentiates them is that is on the free side. So, so and there are all these environments that, that run without instrumentation. You, you're not going to tell a customer, hey, could you go run Valgrind in production or something like that. Or um, for a performance test, you want an exact number or... If you want to know how big the process actually really is getting, you don't want to add to it because then you have to figure out. And um, if you're running tests to see how big you can, you know, what you can fit, what kind of test size you can fit under a particular hardware setup, you don't want this. And for uptime tests, you don't want because you want to be testing with your real stuff. So, and I'm going to go into just the, the two main things that CHAP does. And then later on, I'll talk about how, how that can be used. Um, are there any questions so far or? No, okay. Um, so I have to give you some sort of boring terms. These are just my terms. They're not like really official definition. I'm just gonna use them in this talk. Um, a dynamically all memory allocation function. I'm just talking malloc here. I'm not talking allocators in the C++ sense and you know, I'm not local, alloc any of that. Um, it's just something, it provides a pointer to a, something that's as, at least big enough for what you asked back. Um, it's considered um, to be used until it's given back, at which point it's free. And it, whether the allocator has gotten rid of it at that point or whatever is um, a different issue. But it's considered free at that point. Um, any writable memory at all used by the allocator um, beyond what's used for the used allocations is considered overhead. So I'm including free allocations, but I'm also considering stuff that the allocator uses for bookkeeping, and I'm considering even statically allocated data, um, like the headers that it has for the start. And the reason that's important is like if you're figuring out something like leaks, 
if you've got a reference from in static memory for, for, the, al for the allocator itself, that's very different from something outside, because something outside is a real use from static, but from inside it could be just pointing to it as, you know, for whatever reason. Um, anything other than overhead and used allocations is considered to be outside of, yes? Um, this doesn't use any because it's not a library. It's a stick. No, I, I, meant, I meant when you were when you're tracing your memory that's being used, the allocator that, that you're instrumenting against, how much overhead does that allocator have? Is it like a two percent overhead? I, I'm I'm referring to overhead as a broader thing than that. So our bro overhead includes free memory. So the overhead. Sorry, the question was, do I have a feel for how much overhead the allocator contributes? And um, it's good to bring that up here because it means I haven't, clear, I haven't stated clearly what overhead o is. And the overhead includes everything except ev all the memory currently in use by the allocator other than the, um, other than the used allocations. So, for example, it includes all the free allocations, and it could be gigabytes, uh, depending on whether the freed stuff, is, that memory has been given back to the OS. It could be totally massive. In some cases it is. It's quite common for certain use cases that the overhead exceeds the used allocations. Did I answer? Okay. Um, and outside of dynamically allocated memory, I'm really waving my hand here because I'm even including outside the process. Um, but I'm also including stacks, th registers for threads, um, statically allocated memory, Unfortunately, I'm including things that some user allocated directly via MMAP and that I'm not tracking as well. But Okay, and I'm going to represent allocations. If you see these circles, I'm, I'm referring to an allocation in the sense that I describe allocations on this slide. Okay, so some, other, some assumptions about allocators, again, like malloc and free and so on, is that they, they break up larger ranges of memory. And I don't really... I'm leaving it very hand wavy because we're going to add a bunch of allocators in the future that, you know, um, but it could be, say, they could have some multiple number of pages allocated by MMAP, you know, for example. They provide allocations that are suitably aligned, you know, based on whatever the contract is of the allocator. Um, they allow used allocations to be free. I'm showing that as black. And they can free whole memory range that don't contain used allocations. They can give them back to the OS, but it's not always that easy to predict when they do. And CHAP can give you some help in understanding that. Um, and they often keep some free allocations around, and that's part of the issue where you can't understand it. Do, did you have a question or? No, okay. Um, so here's a simple program to illustrate an allocation. I should say in advance, all these programs are really bad. Um, some of them are, um, but because they're just about being easy to read for the purpose of this. Um, talk. So in this program, it just allocates a big string, which in, in this, when this program was, was run, it was a copy on write string. With, uh, this is an older implement, older implementation of this. It just happened to be that we have environments that use copy on write strings still. I'm just pointing that out because otherwise the core won't make any sense. So then it allocates a small string. The small string goes out of scope causing that small string to be freed, and the program crashes. Uh, I'm just using this always for when I want the program to crash in here. So now we're looking at it in CHAP. And first, you know, again, I started it and specified the core from this. And the first thing, I, there are a bunch of verbs you can think of that you can do with sets of allocations. You saw before that you can count it. You can also list them, which is what I'm doing here. And remember, allocations include both the used allocations, which are the ones that haven't been given back, and also the free ones, which have. So in this case, there's a used allocation here um, of this size, uh, which corresponds, to, we can guess that it corresponds to our big string, and we know the address. This is all in hex, um, and the size, and then there's a free one, which is that small string that got freed, and we know where it started and the size. But the one thing I want to point out is, notice that this address of the used one is, they differ by hex 60, but the size is hex 58. The difference is there's a, in this particular case, it's, I'm not including the parts that are used by the allocator that aren't really supposed to be used by the caller. Some people who are familiar with glibc malloc would ask, 
you know, they've seen the, the, the type def for the, 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 the definition for the structure that's used by glibc, and it has two size t type things at the beginning. And they say, well, why isn't it 16? And the reason is that, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but the, the first part of it actually points into the, the last eight bytes, if you're on a 64-bit thing, of the previous allocation. And you, it really can't be using it while the allocation is in use because it's meant as data for the previous allocation. And then what's this? This is because it allocates in big pieces. And I take the, the remainder of whatever is allocated and, and show it in this way because it's easier to just see. Um, that's in. Okay, so another thing you can do is you can show for any set of allocations. In this case, I'm saying I want to show all the used allocations. And uh, what I wanted to point out here, just to read it, is things are shown in whatever the size is of a pointer with respect to the particular core. It's saying, showing them in that unit. So in this case, the string, which was ABC, is being shown backwards because it's little endian byte order there. But it works better if you have something like this. Who wants to see this backwards? Or if you have a number that's a pointer and stuff like that. So that's why it does it. The other thing I want to point out is in the very last area of the allocation, there's that L. From the, res from the perspective of glibc, that's actually in the following what it calls chunk. But it, can't, it better not touch it because it's part of this data. So the other thing that CHAP does that's important and actually makes for a lot of makes the various use cases work, is it finds references to allocations. And I'm going to have to give some more definitions here and hand wave a little bit. These are my definitions for the purpose of the talk. And they're necessarily big. Like a reference to an allocation is a value somewhere. So it could be, for example, in a register, or it could be in memory, um, that contains something that, you know, paired with some interpretation of that, those bits that allow you to think of it as a pointer to a reference to some other allocation pointing inside. That's vague. I'll show in the next reason why um, it needs to be. But um, a real reference is one where that interpretation is actually correct. You, you think it's a pointer in, to, that other al to that allocation, and it really does point to somewhere within that target allocation. And, oh, sorry. A false reference is one where Chep got it wrong. And I'll show you there's a lot of reasons to get false references wrong, and I'll show you the false references and there's consequences. A misreference, oops, sorry. A misreference is a case where um, there really was a reference there, but it wasn't found. And that's actually quite a bad thing, as it turns out. We really don't want those to happen because it has to do with reachability and leak analysis has to do with reachability. If you're missing an edge, that could be the one edge that allows the thing to be reachable. What is? Oh, an edge is, uh, I'm using that interchangeably with reference. Um, so an edge, if, 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 if A refers to B, the edge goes from A to B. And the, the reason, th sorry, the, so the question was, what is an edge? And the answer is that I'm using it sort of interchangeably with, you know, as a, a sort of directional reference. Um, the, the target of the edge is the, the referenced thing. Um, did I answer your question? OK, yeah. Um, and uh, so some examples of references. These are not references necessarily referenced by chat, but they're ones that I've seen. And there, there's a whole lot more examples. I'm just picking some. Um, a register, this is the most straightforward one. People see this all the time. You know, a register with a thread actually has a pointer to something else. You look at it straightforward as a pointer, and it is. And it points somewhere within that allocation. Um, a pointer size rev range of memory similarly has a pointer to some part of an allocation. Yes. Oh, sorry. And but there are some messier ones that are not supported in the open source right now. Uh, it could contain f of p. Maybe someone like it's a very common case on the Windows side of things that um, certain addresses uh, to sort of protect address layout randomization get encoded. And to deal with that, you have to decode them to be able to treat them as references. Um, or even somewhere totally outside the process holds a reference to it. And that can happen with asynchronous I.O., you know, particularly overlapped I.O. on Windows. But there's also that stuff's going to become more common on Linux as well. So um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so the references of the allocations form a directed graph. Uh, 
And no, that box, I should just clarify it again in case anyone's going to remember. I just find what I meant by outside of allocated, dynamically allocated memory before. You know, so that includes all, a whole bunch of things like stacks and statically allocated memory and registers and such. Um, so I, uh, if it's referenced directly from somewhere outside of dynamically allocated memory, I consider that to be an allocation, an anchor point. Um, if you follow from the anchor point to anything that's reachable by references from that anchor point, those are considered to be anchored also. Everything else is considered to be leaked. So I'm not talking about live leaks here, but just leaked means unreachable from, from outside of dynamically allocated memory. And as a special case there, uh, that I think that, le that right here, the color's kind of hard to read there, but that rightmost dot is supposed to, is the only, the rightmost of the green dots is considered to be unreferenced because there are no edges coming into it. So here, what happens if a false reference is added from B to D? What happens is that uh, D is now falsely considered anchored, so we can't report it as leaked. On the other hand, if the reference from B to C is missed, it's kind of worse because C will be considered unreferenced and pointed as unreferenced. And total design goal of CHAP is to never send people on wild goose chases to, to, to go after leaks that don't exist. So here's what CHAP considers to be references, which is a big subset of uh, a small subset of what I mentioned before. It only, if a register contains something that has a value that could be treated as a pointer to inside the reference, sure, it'll take that. The other is a pointer size memory. That has, it's constrained to be, the pointer size memory is constrained to be on a pointer size boundary, like, you know, um, but it can, it, it has to contain uh, a, something that looks like a pointer to an allocation. Now, CHAP doesn't know anything about liveness or anything like that, so, even though there's a value there, it could not really be a reference. And, but Chap, will, Chap considers it to be a reference because, for the reason I mentioned on the previous slide, it's much better to have false references than missed references. So here are some reasons. There are a lot of reasons for false references under Chap right now. Um, Chap doesn't really know that much about liveness in the sense that it's not it would need dwarf information to know like which registers are live when you're at a particular point in any given thread. Um, uh, it may not know the type at all. Oops, sorry. It may not know the type. Um, it may not know the type at all. It de definitely doesn't understand any structure information right now because it's only looking at the core. It's not looking in the dwarf information. Um, so if you have a structure that's got some big array of bytes in it and Left over some, from some previous allocation, there's something that looks like a pointer. Chap will consider that to be an edge. Um, uh, other issues all, all, all about liveness. Yes? Sorry, I came in late, but when is this analysis taking place? This analysis is taking place. Sorry, the question was, when does this analysis take place? And the answer is that Chap works on a core from an uninstrumented process. So either the process has died and you have that core as a result, or you've run something like G-Core to get a core on a running process that just looks a little too big to you. Okay, so it's basically a dump or something. It, 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 the only thing it works on right now is an ELF uh, core file today, but it could be, the general idea is it's supposed to be some arbitrary process image. Just in practice, today, as CHAP works, it only works on 32-bit ELF core files and 64-bit ELF core files. Oh, yes, I'm sorry there. So it, the issue there is that their allocator is not open source. And so our lawyers said, you do not put something that analyzes their allocator out on open source. And so I obeyed the lawyers. But you are doing it. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that on film. Um, but we're not, we're definitely, we, we can't give it out uh, right now. Uh, and, unless, unless we get Microsoft to agree. Um, the coincidence would also cause a false allocation. You have two integers together or even the contents of a string that happen to look like a pointer.
Um, so reasons for misreferences, again, you really don't want them. They could happen here, but you can, you can generally avoid misreferences by, you do by, for particular processes, don't have any of these consistent, these cases. One is the reference from outside the process. If, you, if you're passing a pointer to someone else, or you, if you're passing a pointer, I wouldn't work well in the, in the shared memory case either, um, uh, your host. Uh, but if your process doesn't use shared memory, you're okay with respect to that. Um, if the reference is in a form of F of P, CHAP does not reference any forms of F of P. Um, it'd be fixable in the future, um, and it's been prototyped, I mean, it's done elsewhere, um, by recognizing certain functions F. You, there's a little bit of overhead because you, could, you may apply some F to something that you think is a reference and, and gain some extra false references that way, but it allows you to avoid the leaks if you do that. Um, the last is if the reference isn't aligned on a pointer size boundary. Now, my view is you shouldn't do that. I mean, it's like talking about like you have a packed structure and you have a pointer in the packed structure, so the pointer is not aligned on a boundary. It works badly with respect to like efficiency in all these different ways. Someone could do it. If someone does decide to do it, I'll, you know, I'll or someone else can add a command line thing. I don't think, I'm never comfortable having the default be to relax that alignment constraint. But if someone wants to add a command line thing to say, oh, you know, you can accept pointers on a four byte boundary, that would, that would actually work okay. You wouldn't get too many false edges. If you allowed arbitrary um, alignment of the pointer, so like on one byte into the object or something like that, you'd be totally hosed because you get massive numbers of false edges. And, you know, you'd, you'd find some leaks, you wouldn't find them all. And when you were using it for other cases, like trying to follow the edges to figure out which container it was, you'd be just looking at spaghetti. So, yes? Could, if, could you do it after, could you do it in phases where phase one says, oh, I've got some uh, things that aren't pointed to, and then you go back and look for um, offset pointers to that missing or, or uh, leaked memory? In other words, you're, you're not looking for any pointer, you're looking for certain specific ones? Oh, um, well, this right now, what it does today, I'm not sure, I've, the question was, could you do this in two phases? I'm not sure I fully understand this question well, if, yet. If, if phase one says, oh, here's my leaked memory. Oh, phase one, actually, phase, what phase one does is says, here are my allocations, okay. and here are my references. And after that, the, the leak memory, yeah. So it's in pretty near after that. You chap as it comes up doesn't, it's lazy about it. It actually just finds the allocations. And it, it, the first time that you do something that imply that you need to understand references, it goes and calculates and figures out the references. So, but you wouldn't know that here. But, and then you have the leaked one. You're saying, if you want to understand, you can, at that point, that's all it does today. You can go follow just. Oh, say, oh, so if, if you want on a, later, on a later phase to do it, well, the issue is that you, CHAP has no way of knowing whether the, for false edges, because it has to treat extras, you would just get, you would get potentially a lot of false edges. I think the correct way to go, and I'll talk about that later, and well, but not until the last slide, so I'll mention it now. The question on that is, if, if, because you're concerned about supporting specifically the case of a pointer in packed memory. Well, I, I, it's so serious when you miss a reference. I'm wondering if it, 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 well, for the try extra hard, well, we're never going to find the ones from outside the process. I mean, the way that you have to do that is you have to, in effect, like what you can do, like in the overlap case, the overlap things have a particular way that they look. And you can look at the allocation, you can say, well, it's probably an overlap thing. And even though you can't see outside the process, you can say, yeah, I think it is. For the reference in the form F of P, if you don't understand F of P, there's no way that doing it in a later phase is going to get you there. No, I was for the, for the misaligned one, what I'd, where I'd like to go with that, I'm thinking about it, um, is that, well, either the person who has the process knows it, because the moment they come up with a false leak, they'll see it and they'll say, I don't think this thing is leaked, and run with a command line. So the second phase is now that then they say, for this kind of process, I do have this particular structure around that has this misaligned. But the other way that I'd like to go long term, which I think is actually better, is at least for, for one use case, is if, 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 we're, if we're supporting the dwarf stuff, 
then you can identify a packed structure that has a pointer in it. Well, I, I don't like them, you know. <laughs> but I, for now, for now, all you can do it, it would. I'm reluctant to do a second pass because it would it would just and the same as it would be in the first pass, it would find the false edges. Um, and I I don't have any good way of telling you know with that many false edges you know what they might be. So here's a program again. Uh, uh, for all along here, I'm alternating some badly written program with um, an even impossibly badly written program with some what Chap does to look at it. So in this case, all it does, it has a vector. It pushes back a string, a vector of strings. It pushes back something that looks like a bunch of digits. It pushes back something that looks like a bunch of letters. It gets rid of the bunch of letters. And then this other part is about, it's just got a single raw pointer, and it does something very bad where it allocates, sets, and the buffer has, puts like one, that pattern in the buffer, the first one, allocates again, clobbering the pointer, puts that pattern in the second buffer, allocates again, puts that pattern in the third. So you'd expect the first two to be leaked because the pointers to them are gone. And it crashes. So let's see what Chap does. And Chap actually, as I can see, because of the false edges thing, it messes up here. I say show leaked, and I expect the first two of those allocations to have been leaked. But only the first, only the second one is, because we see those, those twos in the pattern there. Um, the first one's gone. So we can say, well, what happened there? And if we look, we can also look Anchored is the opposite of leaked, as I mentioned on that previous slide. We can look at the anchored things, and we can say, oh, so the only we see the one with the ones here. So we can say, yeah, it's, uh, 60 minutes left. Thank you. Um, so we can say, well, it's anchored, and it's anchored there. And we say, well, what is that? We look and we see, well, it has this pointer here, and notice that it said offset hex 18 into the one up above. I should have put a pointer there, but you know, I'm talking about here. It's pointing to here, and we can see that's a string. So we've got our vector of strings, and now we can see what happened is that the vector shrunk, but the destructor for string doesn't actually clear the pointer. And so we've got in, in, the, in the second, the, the quad word after the one I'm showing, where the arrow is, is a, is a false reference, is treated as a false reference by chap. So, um, yeah, any, were there questions or, no, okay. So this is a use case of using uh, CHAP to analyze leaks. I should say in advance, I picked sort of a bad case here because I wanted to take uh, some open source thing. And I picked on Nautilus just because it was the first thing that I found that was really leaky. But <laughs> Nautilus is kind of a, um, it's, it's messy in that it uses, I think the library's called G-Object or something like that, and it has all these op opaque things. Um, so that makes it more annoying to go. But I'm, I, I'm going to do a partial analysis of this core. But in any case, I looked at CHAP and I said, how many leaks are there? And it said, well, yeah, there actually were some, 1,008 of things that were leaked. And then I said, okay, so one thing that you can do, a lot of leaks are because there's some root of some tree-like or graph-like thing, but a rooted graph. And if you can identify all of those, often you found all the leaks. If, because the only alternative on the leaks is that you have a cycle. So uh, I said count the unreferenced, and there's way fewer. There's just 71 of them there. Um, so the unreferenced ones are interesting, an interesting place to start. Um, in this case, I suspect that there's probably, because there's, I summarize the unreferences here, and if you look at all the different sizes and what they have, there are probably multiple leaks, different places in the code in Nautilus that are leaky. Um, for example, down at the bottom you see XMP node, which is, um, it found it by a V table pointer there. That's something in Lib Um uh, That, so, Look at this, and I'm looking at it, and it's like, well, where to start? Because there's a bunch of, bunch of leaks here. So I just pick one. And this one I pick because it's kind of a big thing, and it contributes out of the total. I mean, it's not like there's a huge number of bytes leaked, and someone could probably use Nautilus like this forever and never have any real problems because all the events are, well, the, most of the events are done manually, at least that I'm seeing here. So maybe no one would ever need to fix this on the Nautilus. But I pick this, and I notice that, again, the size is hex 308. And so 
as another example of something that you can do for any set, one of the things you can do is enumerate it. And it's just like, you know, I showed you count and show and list already. Enumerate is a lot less verbose in that you could, oh, sorry, for any set, you can constrain the set, the members of the set, in addition to say, I only want the ones of a particular size. And there are other things. You could say minimum size or maximum size or so on. But in this case, since I'm enumerating, it's just giving addresses. And I know these are size 308, and I don't have a very big screen to show you guys this stuff. So I choose to dump them instead, just dump the first hex 40 bytes. And I can see all three of these, they look roughly the same, right? They, they have a number followed by a pointer, followed by a number, followed by a pointer. So that tells me a little bit about the stuff. I can pick one of those pointers and follow it. And I often it makes sense to list it first because showing you could be drinking from the fire hose. The thing might be you know megabytes long or whatever. Um, so I look and I see it's not that big. <coughs> so I'm going to look at it in a second. But first, I just point out this one command. There's a command called explain, which <coughs> it's sort of a catch-all. In some cases, it works rather precisely. In other cases, it's less because of the fact of false edges that it sometimes follows a false edge. It's trying to find paths, but not all the paths, like paths to statically allocated memory. In this case, because we think this thing is leaked, it's very efficient because <coughs> it's just going to look at the graph thing. It says that address is actually at the start of some allocation. And it happens to be leaked. So we just confirmed that the reason is you could have something that's leaked and points to something that's not. And we're trying to figure out the over the cost here and, and whether whether it's interesting to follow that node, one of those nodes. And we suspected that they were, but because the number of leaked things was so much larger than the number of unreferenced things. But if you wanted to be really careful, you could check it like that. <coughs> so we can show the allocation. We see, ah, it just got some other pointer in it. And you can also instead follow outgoing edges and things, but I'm, I'll show you that later. But in this case, I just choose to look at it. I say, ah, oh, there's something that looks string-like. Um, if you don't want to read it in that way, you can do that and say that it's a, a font name. And as it turns out, if, if you go back and you look at this whole buffer, it has a whole bunch of font names. So at this point, I actually did a little bit more on this because the next thing I did is I, I looked for things that looked like those buffers of size hex 308 and I followed them back. You can follow edges back, which I'll show when I'm talking about uh, use allocations. You can follow for the anchor edges, you can follow them back to some container that has them. But I reached one of these G object things and it was actually home der der for Nautilus. But home der der is declared in such a way opaque that the debugger doesn't even know the type or the size. It tells you the size is zero and so then you have to go in this whole rat hole of of understanding G-object and where the things are. I went a little further, but it doesn't bear showing on these slides. At this point, you might, someone might, in a company, they might give it to the people who are associated with fonts and say, here, you go figure this out. <clears throat> so uh, the, another use case, which is actually kind of, a, in some ways, a more important one, because once, you, once you've instrumented in your at your site to be checking for leaks automatically as developers check in. You don't tend to, we found in practice for the processes where we've done that for a long time, it's a very rare case that any leaks make it, make it in because for them to make it past a developer checking in, it means, well, it's some, some case that they haven't tested, which actually wouldn't be that uncommon um, or that it was a false leak. But it's, memory growth is a, is a bigger deal because you might even just want to make your process smaller and want to figure out where the memory is going. CHEP can do some of that. It's, it, I think it'll be better in the future. But So I, I, again, I wanted to pick on some open source thing, but I didn't, maybe I'd learned my lesson with Nautilus. I didn't want to look at code. So I decided to make Bash grow big. And I thought this was a great way to do it. I just wrote a shell script. And all it does is in a big loop, it makes up new variable names and assigns them. And I said, oh, so this will crash really, really, really fast. And I, I turned it on expecting it to kind of come back right away. <laughs> it didn't happen. So I went and ate lunch. And I came back, and the process was still, it was still running. It was not big. And it was getting bigger slow, more slowly then. So I scratched my head and I said, ah, oh, well, this is probably still a good example because it's still about understanding growth, even if it's understanding growth that's slower than expected. And the same techniques here work for something that's really big that I'm going to show. So I started looking at it in chap, 
and I counted the used allocations, and I found out that in the time it took me to eat lunch, which I assure you was at least half an hour, it had only used, it had only allocated like 50 million bytes, a little more than 50 million bytes. So I, I looked, as standard when you're figuring out a process, I'm, now I'm showing just sort of general techniques that one might use for chat. Again, as I mentioned before, the, the free allocations, which I'm counting as part of overhead, can dominate in certain processes. So you have to look at this. And in this case, they don't. Um, the stacks might, in the case that you expect the process to be really small, but you have a whole bunch of threads and you've declared your default stack size too big. Um, but they don't here. And leaked doesn't play into it at all in this case. Nothing was leaked in bash. So now, but I want to see more about what's there. So I, in this case, a command called redirect on, this is when you don't want to direct drink from the fire hose, um, causes the, each command to go to its own file. And so in this case, I do say summarize used, and it goes to the file name is just composed of the name of the core file and then what you typed in the file. So I can go look at this, and I can see, OK, at the top, there are a bunch of things that are of size hex 28. And um, you know they're, they're taking a good portion, enough of the memory that I'm interested in looking at that. I go back to CHAP, and I again say show use, but I I, I still have redirect on because this is going to be a lot of stuff. And I say, I'm only interested in the things of size hex 28 because I want to look at them. And I go look at the file, and I see it's pretty much all of these things where it's just something that looks like a string and something that looks like a bunch of pointers. So I pick one of the strings, that one that I have as the address there, and I'm just going to follow edges backwards. By backwards, I mean if A references B, following the edge forward would be following the edge from A to B. Following it backwards is going from B to A, and that's you use incoming for that. So follow the edges back, and I just, for, them, for each of them, I, I follow it back. I can, I can look at it. I, I'm going to go fast here unless people want me to slow down there. But it's just, you can keep following the edges back and see you know, this points to that. And, but this is fairly, it's, it's the most reliable way in the sense that you're just taking one step at a time. And if you have something like false edges, you can, you can pick a lot more intelligently than it can, which of the edges is interesting to go to. But at this point, I'm getting kind of annoyed following back the couple of edges. And I can notice here that if I do list incoming of that, I can see that this next pointer, the incoming, it points at that one to the start. The start of one contains the point of the start of the other. And if I should guess that I have something like a linked list here, I can follow the linked list backwards using this count reverse chain where I'm specifying the node that I'm starting from and I'm specifying where I expect the pointer to be at an offset in the source of the edge and where I expect it to be in the target. So that's what those last two things are. And I do that and I see that, yeah, in fact, there's 4,100 of them, so I'm glad I didn't try to go by hand in this case. You can also use that the command I mentioned before, explain, but this is more reliable in, in a lot of cases because you're, you're telling it more directly how you want things to follow back, so you're not going to get it to follow any false edges this way. So I redirect on again because I don't want to look at 4,100 edges on my screen. And I list, for any, for any of these sets of allocations, any of the commands apply, you know, count, list, show, et cetera. So I counted it, I can list it also. It goes to a file. I look at the file. This, since I'm doing the reverse chain, the end of the reverse chain is the start of the chain. And I'm just looking, I'm looking in that output file that I just created, and that, it's that address. And I can go find out more about it. One thing is I could go forward on the chain to see, well, was I really at the end? And I did that there by count chain instead of reverse chain. And I can see, no, it wasn't at the end, but there wasn't a whole lot more. There were a little more than 4,000 allocations on the chain. Now, to understand how it's used, I have to go back a little further, and I list incoming on the start of the chain, and I see I've got something a little bigger. And if I, of this size, and if I summarize the outgoing thing, I see that it has like 64 things coming, I see that it has 64 things coming out of it, edges. So now, if, if, I, were, if I were to follow and, and to look, I'm not going to for the purpose of the slide, but if I were to look at each of the outgoing things, I would see that there are all these big chains of like 4,000 things a piece. I could, just <laughs> at this point, we actually know enough. I can go back to figure out what's going on here with respect to why Chap didn't, why Bash didn't die. But I'm going to go a little further, just 
because talking about the growth analysis case, what you would normally do there is you'd keep following incoming edges like this. I'm going back from the edge that I was just at, and again, and finally I find something that has no allocations. And I can say explain that thing, and it'll tell me that it's directly statically anchored. And in this case, statically, meaning you know, from statically allocated memory as opposed to stack or registers or whatever, and it tells the address. And right now you have to let GDB do the heavy lifting in terms of telling you what that address is. Um, you know, maybe it's in some library and you have to be sure to have the symbols for that library or whatever, but you have to open GDB with the proper symbols on that core to figure out what it is, but you could know now the whole, and then follow the types back out once you have the types from GDB and so on. Excuse me, I just have to um, grab a tissue. Sorry about that. Um, Yes and no. It depends for what. Um, basically, yes. I'm sorry. The question was, is the only way to map um, from an address like that to your source code is to use GDB? And I guess the answer is basically yes. The, the one case where the answer is no, which is an important one in C++, is if you um, have a vtable pointer, and the mangled type name associated with that vtable pointer is present in memory, it'll follow back to the mangled pointer and unmangle it, and you can know the type from that. The other thing, way in which you can be spared from doing, let's suppose the vtable pointers weren't in memory. At the beginning, when it comes up, it finds the allocations. It finds out what addresses are interesting to it, what vtable addresses are interesting to it, and it creates this file, whatever the core name is, say it's called core, it creates a file core.simrex. And that simrex, you can feed it into GDB, it'll create a simdefs. And the simdefs, the next time that, if chap between commands, if it notices that there's a simdefs file there, it'll use it, and so you can at least get the things in and batch. That makes sense. Um, and one thing that uh, the older tool, the not open source tool ha has, that this one doesn't, but I'll put in sometime soon, is that for things like these anchors, at least um, is, it's possible to see, it's found that there are anchors up front, so it's possible to throw those into the simrex file as well. And have, it doesn't right now, CHAP doesn't, the AH64 does. Um, but the caveat there is that you're still, in either case, you're required to go back to GDB to actually understand the symbols. And it, it's only as good as what you get, right? In the sense, like, if you, you open GDB and you're supposed by the wrong process, or the process doesn't have symbols, or maybe you're missing symbols for some of the libraries and these things are associated with the libraries. To the extent that what you've given GDB is incomplete, you may get incomplete type names. But yeah, you're, you're stuck with going back to GDB right now for for anchors, and in some cases for type names. It's quite common that the mangled pointer is present, but, okay, so here's another, I'm sorry, I did back on the previous slide, or, or no, just I a question? Go back one. Uh, okay. Not I'm just thinking of the process you're going through as you're exploring all these links, and, <clears throat> and probably at some point reach a dead end, and you want to go back and try a different one. As a human's doing that, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. With chap, okay. You're, you know, you're, you're basically using your own judgment to decide what to pursue, right? That's true, unless there's just one edge. The question was, in the case that there are multiple incoming edges, um, are you using your own judgment as to what to pursue? And the answer is yes, and as long as there are multiple ones, yes, you are. Um, if there's a single edge, no. But And I presume in a lot of cases you do have multiple. That's quite true, yes. The, 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 the comment was that he presumed that, that is, is it common that there are multiple edges? And yes, it, it is common that there are multiple edges. There are, <clears throat> there are cases where some of those multiple, <coughs> those multiple edges are only in the case of false, but if you have something like, say, an STD map where you, know, you have children and parents and stuff like that, the only edge that you're interested in is the one from the parent, really, in terms of following it back to the container, but you've got the edges the parent edges from the children. So yeah, there are 
common cases where there are. Uh, the way that I plan to deal with that in the future is um, with type awareness, then you can know, but also as uh, there's, a, there's a notion that hasn't been fully pulled across yet to CHAP, which is of describers. And um, where, for example, it, it'll reference uh, the string body for a copy on write string, but it could also reference a node in an STD map. Once you have the node in the STD map, at least there can be, you, and you can do a describe command on it, which you can't do right now, but is to be able to say as a hint, well, you're probably interested in the parent pointer at this offset. Follow that one up. And in, the, in, the, in those cases, in that the, the list chain command I showed and list reverse chain, CHAP could tell you that this is the list chain command you really want to go back up to the start of the container. It doesn't right now, and you have to guess. Did I answer your question yeah, kind of, sufficiently? Yeah, I'm trying to get at the process. And, and mm -hmm. this, would this lend itself to kind of a graphical you know, exploration or dig down and, and pop up sort of thing? Well, it it does, command? but the thing about that, so I've explained attempts to do that. The explain command, if you, if you, t you, can, you can, for this, for an allocation, we could have taken the starting allocation we had, and we could have run explain on it. And explain will sometimes give you the correct answer. Um, because it, it has to do with sort of distance, and it's going to find, if it, if, if it finds, say, something statically allocated that's closer, explain will, will tell you, for an anchored thing like this, it'll tell you, it'll find you one path to statically allocated memory, not necessarily the right one. It'll tell you, um, for any stack that's there, it'll tell you one path to each of those. So, so you can see, and that can be nice because you can see that an allocation is being actually implicitly used by a bunch of different threads. Although that could be because they're interested, because someone's written some badly written code that you know you have all these mutexes going on and they're sharing these big collections, right? Um, and they're all looking at the same collection, but they're not looking at the same nodes at all. But um, and but yet they all reach the collection, which is reached by the stack for each of these users. You know, so um, it can take you back also to one register um, for each possibly each thread, one register reference for that thread, and tell you that stuff. The downside is. Because of the presence of false edges, um, you have to you have to look at that with a big grain of salt. And sometimes you always do redirect on for that, but I use that command quite frequently. But you have to open the file and look at it and say, well, I don't trust the the very beginning of this chain, but I trust this whole phase here, and I and maybe the maybe the last eight entries on the chain are enough to get me to understanding what's going on, and the last eight entries are good. Did that answer your question, or? I mean, it's, it's, I'm not sure there is a answer of how to easily do these steps. The answer. Knowing what you're doing. Yeah, the answer is that it is actually the uh, the the comment was that um, that it might you know perhaps not be so easy to do all these steps without knowing your, what what you're doing, and my answer is yes, I agree with that. Well, the, the problem, I've played around with that a little bit, trying, and the problem with that is you would really want, if you, if you supplied a graphical front end, you would want something that showed like a, a, a sub area of the graph, a narrow sub area. Um, like someone had asked, you know, for example, if you did like show, instead of the show, could you have a command like graph and create like input to dot or something like that? The problem is, Dot doesn't really behave that well if the edges are going all over like this, if you have cycles and stuff. And if you have lots and lots of nodes, it behaves worse. So you end up with stuff that's pretty unreadable pretty quickly that way. But if you, um, did I repeat the question enough? So the, the, the question had just been, the, the suggestion had been using, by someone here, using graph analysis, showing a little graph view. And my answer to that, sorry, was, You'd want to definitely, for, for such a tool, you'd want to contain to a narrow view around it. Um, where I'd like to go with this, which I'll talk about later, is having more type awareness um, for, for cases where you want it. Because it, with the notion that you would then, you'd, for the case where you're not doing things by hand, like where you're just automatically detecting leaks, you do it just on a core, but if you really want to look at something deeply, well, yeah, you want all the help you can get, right? So you want all the dwarf information, it, but it doesn't do that today. 
Okay, so here's another case. This is a case that's very commonly used by our developers. Not maybe one as simple as this, but it shows you the general idea where chap can supplement a debugger. So I've got this another annoying program where there's just a, a vector and it's being looked at by two different threads at the same time. One thread is just reading it and all it's doing is it's over and over again it's in a big loop and it's looking at the vector and it's expecting everything to always be 92 in it. And the other thread is just it keeps creating these little temporary vectors and swapping it with the other and so that's where the problem is right but it's it's not necessarily obvious looking at it from GDB. I don't know how obvious it I, I, from the look, some people are squinting. The, basically, the fact that this is unprotected, even though this is just writing this, this swap, it actually causes a very bad problem. And I'll, I'll, I'll show with the chap output what it does, and then we can go back if there are any questions. So I look first in GDB, and it says, yeah, I'm on that line where I expected a 92, and I didn't get one, which is a little strange because this one was only filling the temporary vectors with 92. So there, there was never a case where the vector itself had anything other than 92s. It might have been empty, but it didn't have any non-92 entries. We can see it is, but we can see the vector still has all 92s. But yet we crashed, right? And so we're looking at it in the debugger, and we um, expect 92 is actually a reference to inside the vector. So we're interested in that address. Now, you can see with CHAP the, what happened, because we say list allocation on that address, which is the one that was the reference had. And we can see it's actually pointing to a free allocation. And if we look at the free allocation, we can see it used to have all those 92s in it. That's those five Cs there. But the beginning got clobbered, and that got clobbered is because that, that value that's in the beginning is, is used to chain free, free buffers around. And so the bottom line is what happened, if we go back to the program, when the swap occurred, that caused the only legitimate thing that was in, in terms of the buffer, the, this thing was treating it as owning the vector. The, the old buffer got freed. The old vector body got freed when the new vector got fluffed. So this one had already gotten the pointer to the old vector body and was looking at it, but it, it was freed while it was using it. Clear? Okay. So, but that can be very useful for that kind of thing because, you know, if you're just squinting at it, this, this is a lot easier to understand, right, as in terms of understanding where the reference is than looking at it in GDB and saying, hmm, what's that address? And so, the, a very common kind of thing, if you have some pointer, you don't know what's going on. And this is, this is a very straightforward use case that like all our developers who are in the section, very common thing to go first. Someone sees a crash and there's an address that's interesting to them. First thing, go and see like what's the, you know, the developers who work on the processes that, that, that C++ and all that have it. It's a very common case to look and say, what is that address? Um, sorry. Okay, and the other thing is CHAP can be helpful to you because it detects some corruption, as I mentioned before, because it's walking all these data structures and it can notice certain kinds of inconsistencies. So here in my other annoying program, it just allocates three things, storing them in raw pointers, the pointer, and in this case, it writes past the end of the, of the first thing it allocated, and it deletes the third thing it allocated, and then it crashes on purpose, this program does, and the issue is what can CHAP do for you? And if you open this core in CHAP, it'll tell you the, the, that the contiguous range of pages has been corrupted. It gives you warning about it because it, the reason it sees it is because, you know, each of these, in this particular case for glibc, all these things run together. They have length fields. And it, so it can identify, it can tell you. It tells you roughly that the start of that range has been corrupted and it tells you near where the area of the corruption is. It doesn't tell you exactly what the corruption is. It, um, that someone, say, wrote past the end doesn't know that really because someone could have been outside and had some bad pointer. It doesn't know why that area got clobbered. But you can look at it. And now this is sort of for someone who knows glibc. Otherwise, it might not be all that helpful to you. Um, but the main thing that someone can always get out of this, whether they want to bother knowing the guts of glibc or not, is that the core is corrupt, <laughs> that, that some, some problem occurred. And for example, they shouldn't be trusting leak analysis and there may be some allocations that aren't found. In this case, we dumped the area of memory that the chap was talking about. And we can see, so this is at the very beginning. So there's this length for the first allocation and it's hex size hex 20 because you ignore the low three bits for this. And we get to this and we can see that if you, that 92 got written as uh, in the high bits of that length and it's gonna make it look like a bad length. So it says, ah, 
Now, there's some attempt to recover, as we can see from list allocations, because notice that at 601050, we have another allocation. And what CHAP has done there is it's identified that there are other structures that identify things that are freed. And it looks for the first thing that the arena knows about as being freed and can pick up from where it left off there. This doesn't work. I mean, something that needs to be fixed in CHAP is if what you had was a huge run of used allocations, CHAP would miss all those until the first free one that it found. But this is the level of that stuff. And there are, all, there are other kinds of corruptions that it'll detect, like double freeze and stuff like that. It doesn't call them as double, out as double freeze. It calls them in terms of the data structures that it detects have been messed up. There are fast bin lists used by glibc and doubly linked lists for freed stuff and stuff like that. But the point is that it calls out some of that stuff. And that can be quite helpful when you start looking, because I don't know if you've ever looked at a core where um, it crashed because an allocator said that you know there was something wrong in the free list where it did. And this can get you closer to, it can, it can tell you where the arena is roughly roughly where the corruption occurred. It can get you right within the neighborhood of it. Um, but in this case, you can, right, so I showed that. So the other is, the last one is, yes, so, I'm sorry. It starts on a, on, on, on a core file image. No, I mean, I mean, start analyzing the memory itself, knowing the exact structure of the heap, the nodes, what they sh should look like, etc. And when some node doesn't correspond to the expectation, he detected it as a corruption. Yes. And oh, the question, may I, he asked me to repeat the question before letting, I'm sorry, that's the only reason I'm interrupting you. The question was, um, whether it starts and it's analyzing the heap and it, it reports when it notices some inconsistency, it reports the corruption there. Was that a fair part for where you are so far? So continue like another sentence so that I can repeat the question and then and we'll keep going. Sorry. As I understand, if the code corrupts not the heap itself, not the heap structures themselves, but some fragment of code corrupts the data of another thread or something like that, Chap, Chap will not detect it. Chap will not detect, but it can help you understand it in the sense that, going back to the explain command, it can show you, for example, when you explained the allocation, you could see that it was reachable from thread 11 and thread 15 in terms of GDB. And you could say, hmm, maybe one of those is interfering with the other. But it doesn't report that as corruption whatsoever. It, it just gives you some ways to help understand once you've figured out that it looks bad. Why it, why it might have been. So, and returning to the previous session, as I understand, the very beginning of the analysis starts with the debugger. Debugger? No. The, I'm sorry, the question was, does the very beginning of the analysis start with the debugger? And the only reason it would start with the debugger is if you were using the debugger to, to gather a live core. If the core happened because the process crashed, the analysis starts with CHAP. Oh, in the case of a crash, you're saying? Are you saying? In any case, in any case, as I understand. Well, the case matters a lot because if you're looking at memory growth, you're going to want to start with chap first. If you're looking at an arbitrary crash in the debugger, you're going to want to start with the debugger first because you don't even know what's interesting. You're going to look at the stack trace, say, for example, in the debugger. So, as I understand, the beginning of the analysis of, by chap starts with analysis of the debugging information of the process. Determining where the global variables are. And That's, I, I, sorry, so the, I have to, your understanding was that CHAP started with the analysis, analyzing the debugging information of the process, looking where the global variables are. The bottom line, CHAP doesn't have that because all CHAP has is a core. So what CHAP does is it figures out where the allocations are, where the statically allocated memory is, um, where the, what the register values are based on looking at PT note sections, where the stacks are, and so on. But it doesn't have the, the debugging information in the process because it doesn't have that binary. You just passed it in a core file today. So you can, you can pass only the information from the core file, the locations in the heap, etc. How does he identify the leaked memory? Because okay, the question is how does CHAP identify the leaked memory given that it only has a core? Well, the, the bottom line is what it does is it first it finds the allocations based on just it has heuristics about understanding the glibc. You don't need 
you don't need to ha actually have symbols telling you where the main arena is to find the main arena, or you don't have to have symbols telling you where there are these other things called non-main arenas uh, to find them, because say the non-main arenas are very ob are clear to looking in terms of analysis because they, they, they stand on a 64 megabyte boundary. So there aren't that many 64 megabyte boundaries in the process. They have a particular pattern. You can follow them and then the arenas form a ring. And there are other, if, even if you only have a main arena, there are ways that you can scan for the main arena. So CHEP figures out where all the arenas are and all the heaps. And so then there are these big runs of allocations. And it goes and looks, the, the allocations in the case of glibc, I mean it would do something different for a different allocator, but in the case of glibc there are lengths. So it can follow all those lengths back and chop it in, you know, up into, and so it finds all the allocations, if you were, by, by just uh, an understanding of the data structures used by glibc. It finds references in the way it, the, it so, so that's, the dynamically allocated memory there. And it also knows, for example, where the main arena is. Everything else in terms of being outside of that, it can see based on there's permissions and it knows where the stacks are because it gets the, it gets the stacks by looking, there's a section called PT note that it can look and find the registers for each process so it can know what the, the stack pointer is. It can find a region that has a stack pointer. It can then using that, that stack pointer, it can find the stack. Yeah, and so it knows all the stacks that way, and the statically allocated memory is stuff that's writable, that's everything else. And CHAP gets that wrong sometimes because, for example, if you do an MMAP, CHAP, an MMAP outside of malloc, CHAP doesn't recognize that right now. Maybe you have a local allocator or stuff, but it does its best to do that. It treats that in the, in the same category as statically allocated memory. But does that, does that make sense? So now leaks are about when I was talking back about references in the beginning, and you know, there was a notion of anchor points and anchored. Thank you. Uh, anchored, I'm, that's actually fine. Um, anchored and anchor points and um, leaked and unreferenced. The, anchor, the leaked is everything that's, if, assuming that it's found the allocations correctly, leaks are, and that it's identified whether, there's another trick that it has to do. It has to, for any allocation, it has to identify whether the allocation is user free. And that's actually non-trivial because sometimes you can tell by a bit that's kind of near the allocation, whether it's user free, but sometimes you can't because the status of whether it's user free is whether it's on some list of things that have been recently freed. So you have to be able to walk those lists to find some extra things that have been freed. But it, so once you've found which allocations are used and which allocations are freed, and then you look into from outside the memory, what I call outside dynamically allocated memory, which is the stacks and the static stuff, and that, but not other processes, um, but stacks, statics, and registers. And you look at the pointers in, so you find your, all your anchor points, and then you follow edges in the way that I described, where an edge is just something that looks like a pointer inside another allocation. You take the translative closure of that to following through all the used allocations. Those are all the anchored ones. Everything else is considered to be leaked. And as I mentioned, what it's reporting as leaked is actually a subset of what actually is because there may be false edges that cause things to be considered not leaked that really are leaked, but because of the imprecision, because of the presence of false edges, which I mentioned earlier in the talk. Did, did I answer your questions? Well, we have time here, so if you have, if you have a follow-on question, I'm happy to, to ask, answer it or not, or else I can go into the next, yes. Whichever you want to do, I'm happy to go either way. Yes, do you had a question? Yeah, I, I'm, again, I'm curious about tracking back to a leak, and do you ever use the concept of taking snapshots throughout, a, you know, suppose you're finding a leaked compiler, and after phase one you take a snapshot and say, I would clean then. Okay, the question is whether CHAP ta has the notion of sequences, of multiple yeah, snapshots yeah. and that. And, the answer is that CHAP itself does not, um, but you could take multiple snapshots yourself, breakpoints in GDB or whatever, and look at that. In practice, um, in practice, uh, you mean because you want to find out that in, 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 in between these times, to localize in time where the leak happened. Because it seems like CHAP would be very good at saying, I don't find any leaks. Now maybe there still are some that have been missed, in practice, the reason that the reason that the re, well, Chap's going to miss miss leaks in some cases. It is, but in some cases, it's 
it's, it's not going to, in the, uh, subject to the constraints that I mentioned, it's not going to report false leaks to you unless you have references from outside the process or misaligned ones or encoded pointers or things like that. But um, it's, uh, sorry, um, it's in terms of, it is good at saying that. So you could, you could, cho you could choose to, what I would do for that is, right now the, the state of what CHAP could support today, since it just works on a single core, is you'd have to give it multiple cores. And you could say, if you were looking to say, when did the leak occur? You could take multiple ones and say, oh, and so I, my first core, there were no leaks. And my second core, there, oh, and the, between the, the ninth core and the, and the tenth, there were leaks. You could do something like that if you wanted to. It's a good idea. Um, did I repeat the question adequately there, would you say? Okay. Sorry, were there any more questions before I go on, or should I go to the next? Now, this is the part that I find interesting, because it's talking about, remember I had mentioned that overhead in, you know, includes a bunch of things, but that includes free allocations and so on, and overhead can matter a huge amount in understanding the amount of memory that's used by a process. Um, so, I'm going to introduce a, a little test program. I'm sorry if it's not so readable in the back, but there's room in the front if you want to come a little forward. No? Okay. So this is a test program, and it's all about much of the problems in having a lot of extra free stuff around are, now you could say we'll just use a local allocator, and that's probably true. Um, that's probably the lesson to be learned from this, but they're about the, dis the difference between how long things last in memory, how long, how long things are used. So the, this program is all about that. It, has a list and a vector you can see. And the invariant is when it starts up, the, the list and the vector are empty. When every time reset's called, it pushes a bunch of things back to the list. And this is based on I, um, that variable num spins, how much gets pushed onto the list. So it builds some big list. Then it resizes the vector. So at this point, you have whatever's on the list plus some vector body. and it. The, the, the invariant here is that you have at most one vector body at any time associated with one instance of this class. And then it clears the list. So at the end of reset, you have one vector body allocated and the list is all gone. Okay, so here's a test using that that's interesting for this. The key thing is, so it, it sorry, it, it, it's going to do three calls to the reset. And the middle argument is the, the list size. So in this case, the big thing that does, and this is going to add a million things to the list. Um, but again, going back, since the invariant was in reset at the end, the list is empty, and you might have a vector, what we expect to happen at the end is at the last one, we expect the vector to be of size hex C0, or a little bigger, because malloc's allowed to give you more than what you want. And the list should be totally empty, right? So we look at that, and, and first we say count used. And, yeah, we're right. There's just that one vector body, just one allocation. That's more or less what we expect. When we look at count three, and we see we have a million three allocations, free allocations. And we can see, look further, we've, if we summarize the free ones, you can see that a million of those are all of this small size. So these were list nodes. We can just guess that based on what we were doing. And then the other ones of like size hex 38 and 68 are for vector bodies and so on. So I'm going to show another chord. This is, not, this is about just some insight as to, uh, that's probably surprising at least a little bit, right? That there's so many of those free. This is a very slightly changed program. The only thing I've changed is this one number here. Instead of a million, I have a million 2,490 things. So let's see what Chap says about this. We, same one used, but look at free. Now we only have three allocations, but we're still using 48 million plus bytes of memory. So it's different, but it's not really all that much of an improvement. So I'm going to show one more case related to this. And then we can, we actually have plenty of time, so we can talk about this if you want, or else we can go on to the, um, the last session here. So I changed the number again. I, I dropped it by 10, but it's still more than the original million. And I changed the size of the vectors to be just a little bigger. They were that, in that place before where there was hex C0, before that it was hex 30. So I've made the vectors a little bigger. And you know, so let's see what happens in this case for this process. Well, there's, for the used allocations, um, 
the, the key thing, I actually, I moved the error in the wrong place. I wanted it to be here. There's 134,000 bytes instead of 40 plus million. So little tiny tweaks in the way that process ran have huge effects on the overall process size. Yes? Did you know something when you were tweaking those numbers? Oh, absolutely I did. <laughs> uh, the question was, did I know something when I was tweaking those numbers? And the answer was definitely yes. Thank you. Um, and the answer was definitely yes. What I know is I understand pretty well the policy of glibc malloc. And one aspect of it is that when you take a little thing and you free it, I mean, I was picking on glibc malloc here to sort of make a point. When you free a little thing, it goes on what's beyond, I, I don't know, size hex C0 maybe, or size hex B0. When you free a little thing, you're, it gets thrown onto a fast bin list associated with the arena from which that thing came. And I haven't talked about arenas at all because I didn't have time for the purpose of this talk. But arenas loosely are about uh, avoiding having threads collide with each other when they do allocations. So once something's associated with an arena, it's supposed to be permanently associated with it. And uh, chat, one of the things, uh, so they get put back. So what happened in, these, in that first case that I showed you is all the allocations as they were freed, when the list was collapsed, they all got put back into the fast spin list. So the question is, how do they get back off? Because maybe you want to coalesce things, right? And the answer is that it's a, it's a sort of strange one, is that the way that coalescing occurs is the next time you do an allocation, the question is, do you have enough memory to do you have enough memory to do the allocation or not? And the answer was in this particular case, otherwise it doesn't coalesce. So in this particular case, when the vector body was allocated, so remember the, that, that class that we had that had it filled a big list, it changed a vector body, so it, potentially doing an allocation, and then it emptied the list. At the point that it came to allocate the vector body, um, the, there was enough room in that big chunk of memory that it uses just at the tail. There was enough big room to allocate the vector. So it didn't bother clearing the list. So between the first and the second case that I showed, all that I did is I picked a number of allocations, a list size, such that when it came time to allocate the vector, that there wasn't enough room in that big chunk that was left. So it was like, oh, OK, I need to coalesce the list. But then the difference between the, the second case and the third case, remember the second case was still big. It was just coalesced. And the third case, it had gotten a lot smaller. The issue is why. And the reason is because glibc, with respect to a particular arena and heap, it's not willing. It, you can't get rid of big chunks of memory at the beginning of the thing. You have to, if you can't, touch the end. So I just arranged so that I had just arranged so that there was something still allocated at the, at the end that hadn't been coalesced. So when I picked the smaller vector sizes, like say hex 30, that meant that that, that vector size of hex 30 was still on some fast spin list somewhere. And so it was sitting at the end, so glibc couldn't coalesce. So all I did with that little tweaking in the last slide where I made the, the vector size hex c0, now the vector, when it got freed, the vector body when it got freed, went to a doubly linked free list, but those are subject to coalescing. So at this point, there was nothing at the top, and um, glib uh, c the malloc said, oh, all this stuff at the end of the memory is, is free. So I can go like this and collapse it and give it back. Did I answer your question adequately? Or? Yeah. OK, so I'm, I'm going to show you um, uh, one last case. It's basically doing the same thing as we were doing before. Except that, as you can see here, it starts a second thread. So the second thread does the same thing as we were doing in that very first case. It does three calls to reset, where the, minimal, the middle one does the million things. But now what the, th what the first thread does, it's also doing three calls to reset. But the key thing is the first one, which is only allocating a little tiny list of one member in a spin, it does it, and then it waits for the first thread to finish. So that means at the time this join is complete, the only thing that's left that's um, associated with the first thread is one vector body because 
static short and long term was declared, it was declared statically and the invariant at, when you're outside of reset is that there's one vector body associated with one of these short and long term things. But otherwise, all the list entries are gone, right? Because there's no, there are no reset calls in progress for that second thread. The second thread is done. But now it finishes and it goes ahead and it does its thing with the allocating the million things on the list. And so let's see what Chap says about this. And this is kind of strange. You count free and there's two million four allocations. Keeping in mind that the second million allocations were done after all the first ones were gone. So, you know, the question is what happened? You can see that here and I'm, I'm uh, and that. So that's interesting, right? That, that even though you never had the need for uh, more than a million plus, you know, a vector or two at once, a million in small change at once, there were two million of these allocations in the process. So the question, what happened there? The answer is that, going back to this page, notice the, the, first, the first reset that I have in F and the, first, and the reset that I have here. What that's doing is it's spinning a million times, creating a list, emptying a list, creating a list, emptying a list, but just one entry in the list. So what that's doing is it's forcing the two processes to collide on malloc. The moment that you have a collision on malloc, you get a, another arena because it's glibc is trying to make processes not have to wait for other processes to allocate. So now at this point, after they've both run their loop, which they have at the point that the join, they haven't necessarily finished, but by the time you reach this join here, the, the first one is run at loop, but they, the chances are because those loops were long, the, the loop of this loop in this process and the corresponding loop in the other process, they were running for a really long time in parallel, well, relatively, um, they, that was enough to make them collide. And glibc has this habit that once it's picked an arena for a given thread, it is, stashes that information in a thread local variable, and it won't try another arena for that thread as long as the one's available. And since in this case there are only two threads and two arenas, you reach a steady state that the, the main thread is always using the main arena or the, whichever arena it ended up after the collision, and the other thread is always using the other arena. So there's two arenas here. Sorry, you had a question. Yes? So if you had a limited memory, suppose you, you've only got a million bytes, is this going to crash on you? Yes, it will. Uh, the question is if you have limited memory and, or if you had, if I just twiddled these numbers to be bigger, if, you know, if I was willing to wait around, if I said 100 million, But you're really using two million. Did I repeat the question properly or no? Okay. Um, yes, that's absolutely correct. It could, and it's a, an issue, and there are a bunch of lessons you could learn from that. One is that this type of thing happens in the case of maybe some big thing that the process is doing, like a big request from outside. So the main thing is you don't want to do those big thread requests all across the thread pool. That's one lesson you could learn. The other thing you could do is you could use like a local memory allocator, like John Lycos was saying, or there's a fix for it. In, there's a fix to be made in glibc. I just haven't done it yet, and I, I'll try to get to it in the next month or so. Um, but for now, the big lesson is probably you want to use a local allocator or you want to be aware of which operations use lots of temporary memory and constrain them to a very small number of threads. You don't want to allow them to happen across all your threads. Um, did I answer your question enough? Okay. So um, that's basically, I, let me see, I think that's, we, we talked about this. Um, that's all I had for the main part of the talk, which is good because I only have five minutes left for Q&A. Um, but I guess people have been answering some, asking some questions, right? So I've asked some. So the question is, if you look at this list, um, I could read things around, but I'd rather have you, people tell me, what do you find important? Like, is support for J. Malik more important from your perspective than dwarf awareness? Or... They're, the, the problem is also these things have various costs, and they vary. Like interestingly, like the the, the cost of supporting JE Malik is probably considerably less than the cost of fully supporting dwarf awareness, because fully supporting dwarf awareness to the point that you could avoid false leaks would involve understanding for every thread, you know, which variables on the stack are actually live. 
um, which is a little bit of a mess. So you'd have, you, know, you have to look at the instruction pointer and you have to see which variables are alive associated with that. I'd, I don't know Dwarf well enough to, to do that. I could do it for like structure information and that would, you know, the, the Dwarf stuff could be done partially. Like you could say, well, I look at this, I know this type, I look at this thing and I see that there, this is a buffer here, so I'm not going to be willing to see any pointers in this range or something like that, or there's no pointer here. And that, that, that would be fairly, relatively fairly fast to do that much. And if one had that, then one could take sort of the transitive closure going outward from like an anchor point and go, so say you don't know the type of the, of the anchor point because you don't have a V table pointer in that anchor point. You could say, oh, well, I look at the reference from the stack, if I have the dwarf information, I know the type from this, and now I know that it has pointers to things of type A, B, and C, and so I can follow those edges out. And that works for a while unless you have something like this G object that I was seeing in Nautilus where they're really trying to obscure types. Even then, there's probably some tricks that you could do. It's just less straightforward. You can't do it just based on sort of known type of the reference. Um, you have to in inspect the object a little bit. But we could identify way more of the types there um, that way. So, that's, that's one possible, possible direction. The other, though, if I've heard from some people that they only use J.E. Malik, and so and maybe even some people didn't come to this talk because they, they only use J.E. Malik, and when they saw that it only supports G. Live C. Malik right now. So that would be another thing. I think, like, Rust, for example, under the hood uses J.E. Malik, and not, so for Rust, it's not useful. I, I think I was asking Ali yesterday that D might be using G. Live C. Malik, but, and if it does, then this is a, immediately applicable to D. Um, but if, if it happened to use J.E. malloc, it wouldn't be. So that'd be another choice. Um, custom allocators, like maybe the local allocator, for local allocators mentioned by John Lakos, we, there could be support for that. Um, support for something like Valgrind for the case that someone really, like they really wanted to know for a leaked object where, this, where it was allocated, you know, if you had it, I mean, maybe that. Um, uh, corruption analysis, there's some, there could be a lot more than there is. Um, I've touched lightly on that. Improved corruption, recovering case of corruption, what I mean by that is like in that example where I showed you where there um, was a right past the end, I'm depending on walking the free list structures to know where the next allocated thing is. Um, and if there are a, bunch, a run of used allocations, I miss it. There are ways of heuristics for figuring out that you've got to go get earlier in the run and recover more allocations. New verbs, one I was thinking of was for annotate because like, for example, say you're looking at a stack and chap knows for, a, can look for each of these addresses and say, oh, hey, that points to a reference. So it'd be maybe nice if you were looking at something in GDB and you said this part of the stack's interesting. Sometimes GDB ref messes up, um, say, stack unwinding because maybe you haven't given it the correct symbols or also, it can do it just because maybe you followed a bad return address or something like that. If it starts with a bad RIP, it's like hosed. But it could be very helpful with something like GDB to be able to try to figure out where something is for this to be able to say, oh, this is an object of this type that's sitting on the stack to annotate a particular memory or the contents of a buffer or something like that. So that would be a new verb. A new objects, it could maybe walk specific data structures used by the allocator if you wanted to, for like educational purposes, understand what they were or um, um, uh, other objects might be the, the STD map containing a particular node would be something that we could add as support for. Tell me, tell me the whole collection containing this arbitrary node. Um, code, okay, so do, do people have strong opinions about what they'd like to see next or in, in CHAP? Yes. So I think the type information is extremely valuable. The type information where the V table. So the, the, the comment there was that uh, the, the type information associated with objects that don't have V table pointers in it and it would be extremely valuable. And that would be your priority. Okay. Yes? Custom allocators would be great. For which, oh, sorry. Custom, Could, allocators. custom allocators, like the ones John Lycos mentioned. Awesome. You can, um, is, is, is your allocator, oh, so the, the statement was that your, pri his, this fellow's priority was that custom allocators. Um, now that could go two, two ways. CHAP is open source, so you could just add one, and is, is, is your allocator proprietary or is it open source? 
Well, so this 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 is this is a, this is Chap is under um, a GPL too. So it means that you wouldn't be able to like sell it or something like that, but you could certainly you could add it to Chap to your version used in house, mm -hmm. a custom allocator uh, support for a custom allocator. It just if you have if you look at the code, it's it's a little messy right now to do that. Not terribly, because in the sense, so the the level at which Chap is, you know, these type of things when you're sort of supporting manyness, it the the level of manyness that has been supported is as alluded to earlier in the talk. There was at least one other allocator supported that is not present in Chap right now. So the notion of having supporting multiple different kinds of allocators is supported by the notion of an allocation finder, and you could write your own allocation finder. In this case, the problem is that you want to support your allocator coupled with um, coupled with on top of say glibc malloc, or I don't know if you use that one or uh, or j malloc you use or. Oh, you do everything yourselves. Oh, that, that's quite interesting. So now the interesting thing there is you actually are a slightly, well, what I was going to say before is CHAP has never been used to support, um, ha, doesn't have, has never support, so been in the case where for a process it's, it's supporting multiple allocators at once, right? It's either the ones that it does, so it's uh, a 32-bit glibc allocator or 64-bit glibc allocator or, you know, something that's not a chap, um, but the, the code, the, the infrastructure there is in place for that. But to support that, like say glibc malloc plus your custom allocator, there'd be a little, little it, there'd be minor tweaks to no, support the notion of multiple allocation finders. And I should probably go tweak that. Yes, sorry, change that. Does it detect? Uh, can you can you explain it a little more clever? The question was, does it detect dangling pointers? And my counter is, can you explain more what you mean? Pointer pointing to deallocated memory. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't detect it today because it doesn't report it today because it doesn't know about actual liveness of the pointer. So it it could. In the sense of what you could do, we could add a feature for that, and that's a, uh, an interesting one. I it just to report to ask if. But the problem is today, since it doesn't know if the pointer's live or that, it would be can create a lot of noise. Um, you can ask yourself manually what that pointer points to. But in terms of saying that it did, you would have to have some not only syntactic knowledge. We, this goes back to the dwarf stuff, again, in identifying the types. You not only have to have, you know the type, you'd have to know the structure uh, information to know that, say, you're not in the middle of some buffer that was left over from, you know, just uninitialized memory that happens to have a pointer. You'd have to know that. And you'd even have to know semantically, because you remember the, the case that I showed before with vector. The vector, statically, that buffer has some maybe big array capable of holding n objects of type t. But as they're destructed, the, the issue there with the vector is you, if you had semantic knowledge of the vector as opposed to just the syntactic stuff, you would see that the vector has a pointer to the very beginning, the base, a pointer to the limit, and a pointer to how much it's actually used. But you have to follow that as well. So you have to, you have to know that that middle pointer in the vector that points to the vector body is actually used in that way to make these other things dead, or you'd be reporting stuff that's not interesting, right? It's not interesting if a dead part of a vector points to dead memory, to memory that's, to freed memory. Um, sorry, are there any more questions? We're, I'm a little over, but I'm fine asking questions until they kick us out of the room. Just a quick one. <laughs> if, if on deallocation, you could get it to clear the memory to deallocate, so basically everything you're looking at is live, does that, make a huge difference to you? Um, it could, yes, it would It would reduce false edges. Um, and in fact, there are settings that, the, so I'm sorry, the question was, would sort of overwriting patterns in the memory on freeing make a difference And with respect to false edges? And the answer is absolutely, it does. Um, it would, but it doesn't fix the vector case. Because the vector case, it's as the vector shrinks, not as the vector frees. Yeah. So it doesn't, it doesn't allow me to suddenly say it's safe to do 
um, this other notion of flagging every time there's a pointer to a freed thing. To do that, I have to have semantic knowledge. And even not only, I even have to know at what point I am in the constructor, right? Because, uh, well, uh, there, there's, but there's two subcases. There is, are you using this thing that clobbers a memory or not? But let's suppose even if you are using the thing that, if you're using the thing that clobbers a memory, well, no, let's, in the case that you're not, which is the default. Um, when you get to a particular point, maybe you look at the struct definition for a particular allocated thing and you say, yeah, there's a pointer there. But how do you know that you've gotten far enough in the constructor that you've actually set in that field? Uh, there's a lot more sort of dwarf awareness stuff that you, you, you have to go back then and look at who, which thread owns that thing, which thread owns that thing, and where are they in it. And that's actually kind of a hard problem. But in terms of eliminating most of the false, false hedges by just assuming that, that such a pointer, if it's there, that you've gotten past the constructor, that's less hard. And that's, that's likely to happen sooner. Yeah, I was thinking about the question before about the dangling pointers and, and that if you overwrote any memory, so you knew to, that a pointer pointing to that stuff is dangling, then well, say, say one thing that I could do, and if you want to, if you, the fellow who asked that question could file an issue about it, which I would be happy to do right now, is, you know, we're talking about sets of objects and verbs again. And an object could be the show me all the free allocations referenced from the allocation I'm on. So the command would be something like list free from and then the address of the allocation and could do that. That would be very comfortable today because then you're not, you're not drinking from the fire hose, right? You're just saying, I'm following just one set of edges out from this dot, and I want to know which ones of them are for free, and I'm taking the responsibility to figure out which of those are actually there. So yeah, that's, um, did I repeat the question on that or not? I did? OK. I, well, I, the question uh, the, was also not whether I answered it, but whether I repeated his original question adequately. And you think I did? OK, that's excellent. OK, are there any more questions? Or? I was in private. I was not listening in private. OK. OK. Um, so no, the public questions are done, or is there another? No. Or no? The only meaning is that my daughter is very fond of that number. <laughs> uh, the question was, when I use 92 in all these slides, does it have any special meaning? And the answer was, my daughter is very fond of that number. It yes. confused all of us because we're used to 42. <laughs> uh, the comment was, it confused all of us because we're used to the number 42. Is 42 actually common? Or are you now you're joking with me? <laughs> The common thing to use to crash. The comment was that that 42 would be less confusing to people. Um, do you think I should? Um, do you think I should change it, or can I leave this up to my daughter? Okay. Okay. Thank you all.